I used my first wish. Before I get into that, I should begin this update by filling you all in on what the insurance company said about the drunk driver destroying my living room. After they sent someone to inspect the damage, they informed me that my roof had collapsed sometime during the night. Because of the extensive damage, they opted to pay me out, so I had the pleasure of looking for another house in this housing market. That's the real r slash no sleep story. <sighs> in the meantime, I have been staying with Rami. On one hand, I appreciate having somewhere to crash, especially since it's a place that I know the churl would not dare to seek out. On the other hand, cohabitating with someone that you're slightly afraid of is an experience. For the most part, he lives normally, albeit with all the lights dimmed. What is noteworthy is that he doesn't have any food in his fridge or cupboards, unless you count Absolute and Old Granddad as meals. However, there are Tupperware containers full of some dark fluid in the freezer that I couldn't identify. He saw me eyeballing them and playfully warned me that I probably wouldn't want to consume them. Well, that confirms something that probably won't be surprising to anyone. That's not coffee in his work thermos. It's a Long Island. <laughs> After having a rough go of house hunting, I considered using one of my wishes, especially since I've overheard far too many people at work complaining that they've been searching fruitlessly to find houses for well over a year. I also definitely didn't want to overstay my welcome with Rami. The problem with that is that jinn are notoriously tricky when it comes to granting wishes. For example, say someone were to wish for a million dollars. The jinn would achieve this by arranging for both of the wisher's parents to die so that their combined life insurance policies would equate to the million dollars that the wisher had requested. So, if I were to use one of the wishes to find a house, I'd have to be clever about the way I worded it. I'm fairly confident that Rami wouldn't go easy on me just because I'd helped him out with Matthew. I'd probably end up with a shack in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Something that works in my favor, though it is thoroughly depressing, is that I'm not really close to any other people. I don't know anything about my birth family, and I also never felt like it belonged to any of the foster families I stayed with, so inheriting a house by losing someone dear to me wasn't a concern. Even so, I spent a great deal of time writing out every condition that I could think of, one of them being that another living human being couldn't be harmed in order for me to obtain the house. The house had to be located in town. The house had to not only be suitable, but also desirable to live in without any structural damage. It also had to have enough yard space, as well as healthy grass for Constance to run around with. I fell in love with the name Constance for my little goat friend instantly, so thank you, you slash Doyorette. I'm probably butchering that, but eh. As much as I like the name Lilith that was suggested by you slash wild passenger 9855, I worry that naming her after a demoness would be inviting even more chaos into my life. She's already a chaotic animal to begin with. There were more conditions that I outlined in the paper as well, but I figured that I would spare you all from having to read a 3,000 word document about every little disaster I could think of when it came to using one of Rami's wishes. Just know that I tried to leave as little room for interpretation as possible. When I presented my list of conditions to Rami, he laughed and asked if I wanted a lawyer present. Now, I know that I'm just going to be feeding into the Rami thirst by telling you all of this, but here you go. In my haste to get everything figured out, I approached him when he'd just come out of the shower, so his dark hair was still wet, and he was in the process of buttoning up his shirt, pausing partway through when I handed him the list. And for the record, it was the necrotic tissue on his chest that had me distracted. Not anything else. As he silently read the list, a smirk slowly formed. I did my best to keep my eyes on his face, trying to gauge his reaction as my mind raced to figure out if I'd forgotten something important. You really don't trust me, do you, Labrat? He chuckled eventually. I replied carefully, still not entirely used to being able to speak again, and worried that saying the wrong thing could have that privilege taken away from me. I've just read up a lot on Jin and how wishes work. It's nothing personal. Oh, I don't take it personally. In fact, I think it makes things more interesting. Oh, no. There was a part of me that was afraid that would happen. That by being so meticulous, Rami would take it as a challenge. <sighs> I quickly reminded him. I haven't officially made any wishes. 
I even made sure not to use that word or any variation of it on that document. I just showed you the terms of a potential wish that I haven't spoken into existence. If you're wondering how I suddenly became so eloquent on the spot, I didn't. I had that written at the top of the page as a disclaimer and memorized it just in case. Rami's grin widened. I know, I know. There's no reason to get anxious. Unless you think that you forgot to mention something? He's such a little shithead. Rami set the list down on the table between us, leaning forward with his palms on the surface. I pretended not to notice that his shirt had opened up a bit more, revealing more of the blackened patch of tissue right above his heart. He'd said that it didn't bother him, but how couldn't it? Why don't you look it over one last time? Since you're not going into work today, that'll give you plenty of time to agonize over it. We'll talk it over. And agonize over it, I did. Even though he was most likely just fucking with me. I also didn't want to take any chances, especially now that I unintentionally made this a game for him. Something else to mention is that even though he gave me my voice back, we still had that sixth sense for each other. In hindsight, I should have been smarter about that and tried to include it in the bargain for stealing Matthew's wards. Like always, I'd been desperate. I need to learn to be more thorough and level-headed when it comes to dealing with Rami, no matter how stressful my circumstances are. When he got off of work, he checked the additions that I made to the list while I nervously studied him. The only thing I could gather was that he was vaguely bemused, which made me even more antsy. I told myself that I didn't forget anything. He was just trying to make me squirm. Of course, when he finished, the shithead said mildly, It's fine. Perfectly fine. I stared at him, trying to keep my expression and voice even. I know you're just trying to get me to doubt myself. He shrugged. It's your wish, man. What happens with it is entirely up to you. You don't have to listen to a word I say. He snickered as I snatched the list from him to try to check it again. I could see the ominous shine of his eyes in the corner of my vision as I racked my brain, trying to think of anything that I could have missed. I assured myself that Rami was just being Rami. He was messing with me. I'd covered all my bases, hadn't I? I steeled myself, and with a heavy sigh, I slid the list across the kitchen table towards him. His eyes didn't leave mine. I made sure to choose my words carefully. I'd even rehearsed them to Connie and Siri before he came home. I wished for him to find me a house according to the conditions that I had written out on the piece of paper in front of him. Rami winked at me. Your wish is my command. He got out two shot glasses, declaring that we should drink on it. I tried to collect myself as he brushed against me to set a shot of absolute down in front of me. On a count of three, we drained our glasses together. Before the vodka had finished its pleasant, burning journey down my throat, my phone vibrated in my pocket. The realtor that I had been talking to over the past few days cheerfully informed me of a new listing that was well below my budget while ticking off all the boxes that I'd given her. I just had to be quick since there were some people already interested in it, even though it had only been listed a few hours prior. When she gave me the address, I froze. It was Matthew's address. Mouth dry, I glanced over at Rami. With that familiar, devastating smile, he nodded. I sputtered that I'd be more than happy to put in an offer for it. I tried to ignore Rami's quiet laugh as she asked if I wanted to check it out first. I assured her that I'd seen the house before, making up a story about how the previous owner had been an acquaintance that I'd met through a friend from work. She went on to gush about how the house was in excellent shape, was located in a picturesque spot by the lake, and had more than enough land for Connie to frolic in. It was exactly as specified in the list of conditions I'd given Rami. I see the mistake I made now. Technically, the owner had been harmed as a means for me to obtain the house. Matthew's death had not only occurred before I was given the three wishes, but it was also entirely unrelated to my house search. After the realtor happily informed me that my offer was put in, she hung up, leaving me to deal with an incredibly smug gin. Rami tossed back another shot, raising his arms in a sarcastic imitation of a bow. All I could think of to say to him was, You are the worst. You know that? He poured me another shot, that devious grin not leaving his face as he gave my shoulder a pat. 
and don't you dare forget it. The purchase of Matthew's house was accelerated by Rami's supernatural influence. According to the realtor, the family of the original owner wanted nothing to do with the house. They didn't even care if I moved in before closing. For them, Matthew's former home served as nothing more than a dark reminder of how they'd lost not just one, but both sons in less than a month. They just wanted to be rid of it so that they could mourn in peace. Wasn't that just so tragic? Yes, it was tragic, I agreed numbly. It was chilling to see the house without its two flags on the porch. The front door had been replaced as well. I guess that the real estate company figured that the massive shotgun-induced hole in it would hurt the resale value. While Matthew had destroyed my home and tried to blow off my head multiple times, I couldn't stop the guilt from clenching my heart firmly in its cold grasp. Rami, however, was living for it. He offered to help me move in at the low, low price of a fresh bottle of vodka, since we did a number on his during my stay. I accepted, mostly because I didn't have many other options. Moving services are expensive, and currently, I have plastic wrap taped over my car's broken back window, which isn't going to be cheap to replace. I'm gonna have to pinch as many pennies as I can. While trying to deal with my housing situation, I had forgotten all about the talismans in my trunk. While carrying a box out to my poor, beaten-up PT cruiser, Robbie suddenly froze and calmly asked why I still had them. Shit. After what had happened the last time he caught me in a lie, I was afraid to try to deceive him. So I told a truth. Oh, I wasn't sure how you wanted me to dispose of them. He shrugged a shoulder. You can just set them on fire. I'd appreciate it if you could take care of that before we head over. I think I've got some matches in the apartment. After he retrieved the matches in literally the blink of an eye, he stopped me as I started to walk away with them and the wards in hand. Oh, and by the way, lab rat, when I tell you to burn them, I mean for you to destroy them. Don't try to get smart with me, all right? Despite his nonchalant, friendly tone of voice, dread pulled in my stomach. I said that I wouldn't, then set off into the nearby woods to do what needed to be done. Matthew had to have found them somewhere, it was at least helpful to know that Rami wasn't completely invulnerable. I just had to take a picture and do my homework on them. The talismans had Arabic characters carved into their wooden faces, with each individual character separated by a grid. They were distinctive enough. It took some time for the thick wood to ignite, but eventually they were reduced to nothing but charcoal. Thankfully, the rest of my move-in went by with only minor issues. Siri has been discombobulated by all the new changes, so the poor kitty has been hiding under the couch since we got inside. Connie just seems to be happy to have more space to clop around in. I wish I could say that my first time sleeping in the house was uneventful. Sometime in the afternoon, I found myself staring groggily at my ceiling, having had a nightmare that I couldn't remember fully. It had something to do with teeth. My door opened slowly, as it normally does when Siri decides that she wants to curl up in bed with me. But for some reason, she was taking her sweet time jumping up. Still half asleep, I patted the blanket for her to come up. Instead of her familiar trilling, I was answered with a guttural, gurgling sound. <coughs> the same grotesque noise that Matthew had made as Rami made him swallow his own gun. That woke me up. I sat bolt upright, expecting to see Matthew's specter in the doorway, but I was alone. Tense, I stayed frozen in place, listening intently. There was that gurgling again, down the hall. My heart stopped when I heard Connie bleat. Oh God, please don't hurt her. Slowly, I got up, sweat running down my back as I crept quietly as I possibly could toward my bedroom door. I had to grab the wall to steady myself as I slipped on something. I looked down to see that my socks were covered in red. Connie was turned away from me, head tilted up, gazing at the end of the hall at nothing, bleeding the same way that she does when she wants either Rami or I to hold her. I cautiously approached the goat, glancing around the hallway into each of the rooms, my breathing shaky. I got to Connie. In front of her was a puddle of blood. How did... She turned towards me and bleated again. I didn't dare to turn around. I squeezed my eyes shut, feeling more and more of that substance leave a freezing trail down my arm, making me shiver. The gurgle happened again, but this time I could make out two words. 
face me. I didn't. I kept my eyes shut, even as icy fingers seized my arm, digging roughly into my skin. Whatever was behind me growled. Its hold on my arm tightened until pinpricks appeared in the tips of my fingers. As it held on, my arm eventually went completely numb. Distantly, I began to wonder if it could snap my arm off. Face me. Still, I refused. Abruptly, the hand on my arm was gone, along with a pungent odor of decay. Metal crashed to the ground, making me jump out of my skin. Trying hard to keep from hyperventilating, I stood there, frozen for what felt like hours. After hearing nothing but grave-like silence, I eventually got the courage to open my eyes. The grate for one of the vents in the living room had been torn out, sitting on the floor across the room. Gingerly, I stalked towards the vent, unaware about every creak in the house, ignoring the uncomfortable feeling my wet shirt clinging to my skin. Inside of the vent sat a small stack of dusty notebooks. With them tucked under my arm, I dragged Connie back into the bedroom with me. It took a lot of treats to get Siri to join us, but after what had just happened, I didn't want to leave either of them alone. There is a perfect purple imprint of a hand on my arm. It still hurts to move it. I think whatever had grabbed me had bruised the muscle as well. Also, it's a good thing that I didn't care about that shirt. There would be no way to fully get the blood stains out of it that the strange intruder had left. There's no way that I'm going to be able to get back to sleep, not while every noise makes me flinch. That thing that was in my house has to be Matthew, or more accurately, it used to be Matthew. I don't know if he's some sort of ghost or something else, but whatever he is now, he wanted me to find these. While that makes me scared of what's written on their pages, I'm hoping that one of these notebooks will have some information on the talismans. I haven't gotten too far into them yet, so I'll get back to you all when I found something interesting. <laughs>